Uh, today I have a lecture on uh, potential fields for motion planning, either using a robotic arm or a haptic device. So the idea is to create um, a field of forces in which the robotic manipulation, uh, manipulator moves or the haptic device moves. So you can use this in two ways, either to uh, tell the robot w where to apply forces to, towards a goal or uh, to use a haptic device and create constraints or create force feedback using potential fields. So the objective of this lecture is to introduce you to, to potential fields and see how we can calculate potential fields for simple scenarios. Uh, and a lot of you can use this for your design projects. You can directly implement what are going to see uh, in this lecture in your design project. What's the objective of a potential field? Is again to plan a trajectory, to determine areas in the, the robot's environment where it should go to or areas that the robot should avoid. So you're going to convert obstacles and goals into a field, in a two-dimensional field, in the examples you're going to see here, field of forces that are going to be applied to the robot. So when you approach, for example, an obstacle, the robot will receive forces that will repel that from the obstacle in the same way that the haptic device would, would react. When the robot has a goal or the haptic device is to move the user towards a goal, we want the haptic device to display forces to the user that it will attract the end effector towards that goal. So this is one way to do that. There are many other ways, but this is um, the one you're going to see here. It is a bit complicated. But the implementation in MATLAB is relatively straightforward, and I have some examples here that you can use. So by the end of this lecture, the objective is to understand the concept of potential fields for robot control or for haptic feedback generation. That works as well. Uh, model and program a potential field and understand how this can be applied specifically to the context of robotic teleoperation. Some uh, applications here in the context of um, surgical applications and um, it's very similar to two projects that uh, um, I heard about projects that you're working on. If we want the robot to uh, follow a very specific predetermined path, how can we program the robot to go along that path and not deviate from it? If the, um, or, or how can we program the haptic device to assist the surgeon uh, with not deviating from that specific path. So if the surgeon deviates from the path, the haptic device would somehow uh, move the, the controller back to, to its intended path. How can we implement a function like that? Another option is, so here we have a, an example of a goal. Right? We want to go along a line and then the robot will go along a line or the haptic device will pull you towards that line. But it could also think about the, the opposite way. What if you don't want to go to certain areas? How do we prevent the robot from going into those areas? Or how do we create a field of forces that would not let you deviate from, let's say, a um, square in the workspace when you use the haptic device? As soon as you touch virtual walls, it would receive forces that will keep you from penetrating in those walls. How we can create these field of forces, or more generally, in haptic simulation, how can we create the forces as we interact with a virtual environment? So as I said, there are many ways to do that. The way you're going to, to use here, or the method you're going to use here, is the method of potential fields. The idea is quite simple. We're going to consider the robot, the goal, and obstacles as um, having a uh, simple way to put this, different charges. So here we have the robot on this side, and we have the goal on the other side, and we have obstacles in the way. So we want to go from the current position to the goal, and we don't want to touch the obstacles, and you want the robot to be attracted to that goal. So here we have a negative charge for the robot, negative charge for the obstacles. They would uh, repel one another, and then the goal has a positive charge, you now attracting the end effector towards it. So we would go in the middle there and reach the goal. So how do you actually formulate this mathematically? Well, mathematically, we need to assign a energy to the position of the robot. And this energy assigned to the robot in a workspace will have a minimum 
point of energy. And that minimum point, you guess what it is, is the goal. The idea is to assign a, a, a three-dimensional field of um, a, an energy field. And the bottom of that field, the minimum uh, um, energy is where the robot is going to, because it is always converging to the point of lowest energy, point of equilibrium, point of lowest energy. So if that is the case, then if we are far from a goal, we should assign positions that are far from a goal as having a high potential energy because we know that it wants to converge to a low state of energy. Close to obstacles, should the energy be low or high without looking at the slide? If you want to stay away from it, should it have a high energy. So we always move towards a lower state of energy. And then the goal is where the zero potential energy is. Right? So how do we assign an energy? I know that this point sounds quite abstract, but we'll get to an example. But that's the idea. We assign what we're going to call here a potential energy in different portions of the workspace. And we'll, we know that the robot will move towards the lowest point of energy in that workspace, which in this case here is the goal we have. Now we have to come up with the mathematical functions that would um, describe, would implement these assumptions. Right? So we are now assigning a potential energy to different points in the workspace. And what's the derivative of energy over time? was the gradient of energy in a three-dimensional three field is the force. All right, so the, the, the gradient of that energy that we are assigning to the workspace is the force. What does that mean? It means that now I know what force I have to apply to the robot to bring it from its current potential towards a lower potential. All right, so the first, the first step is to create this energy function of the workspace. We take the gradient of it, and when you take the gradient, we now create a two-dimensional or uh, n-dimensional field, vector field, and the vector represents the forces that you have to apply to bring the robot to the lowest potential in that field. So if you have here a n-dimensional workspace, like a 3D would be n equals to 3, the gradient is simply the partial derivatives of the um, potential with respect to each dimension one at a time. Right? That's exactly the, the, the gradient we saw in uh, the optimization class when you talked about the optimization methods. But here is now the partial derivative of the potential. We haven't defined the potential yet. We're going to come up with equations for that later. Right? So the gradient is then the partial derivatives of the potential with respect to each degree of freedom. So if you have a three-dimensional case, this would be x, y, z, and so on. Right. By taking the gradient of this field, we create now a vector field over the space of all degrees of freedom q. And the force is simply the negative of that. This force will assign a negative sign because now we'll point towards the point of lowest potential. The forces are always pointing towards the point of lower potential. So the result is a vector field. If you position the robot at any point on that, uh, in that space, you'll know what force you have to apply in which direction to bring the robot towards the point of lowest potential. So let's give, so the, the, what is left here to do is to create this uh, potential field and assign a potential energy to different points of the workspace. So here is an example. There are many ways, but here would be one of them. We have a goal. It's a point where we want the robot to go, and we have the actual position of the robot over there. And so the robot is at a point Q that has coordinates X and Y. The goal is at a point Q, G, Q goal, and it has coordinates X, G, and Y. G. We now have to assign or create a potential function that gives us the potential at different points of the workspace as a function of position of the robot. 
When you take now the, 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 the gradient of that and do a negative sign here, we have the partial derivative of u over x, partial derivative of u over y, because it's now a, uh, we have a two-dimensional space, x on y, and the result of this is a vector. This vector is a vector of forces. It has now the forces we have to apply in x and y to bring the robot from its position towards the goal. Does that make sense so far? We'll do a numerical example. Hopefully, that will help. Yeah? This is the position of the robot arm. This is where we want it to go. FQ is the function that defines the potential that any point in the workspace has with respect to the goal. So if you want to go towards the goal, we know that at this point here has the lowest potential. Now we have to somehow come up with a function that assigns the potential everywhere else as a function to, to go towards that goal. So what we could say, a very simple assumption is, that the potential increases with the distance from the goal. The potential increase, uh, one, one assumption, increases with the distance from the goal. So this could be, for example, f of q, could, could be the Euclidean distance between Q and QG. Does that make sense? And when you now take the derivative of it, we have a force field that it would bring the robot towards the goal. So here is one example. That's exa using exactly what I just said. I'm assuming that, it, so this is the goal, and these are all other points where the robot could be. This is X and Y, right? So this is the entire workspace. And this is the potential that I assign to different points of the workspace. And as you can see, the lowest potential is at the goal. So if the robot is far from the goal, it has a high potential. As the robot approaches the goal, the potential goes down. I haven't specified the function for this yet, but it could be the Euclidean distance between a point and the goal. When I take the derivative of this, the der uh, excuse me, the gradient, the gradient, because this is a two-dimensional space, it will be a two-dimensional vector. Each point now on this workspace will have a two-dimensional vector with a force that points towards the goal. So you see this plane here is the same as that plane. So if the robot is at this point, let's say, I know that this is the direction of the force I have to apply so that it, it, it goes towards the goal. Does that make sense? A bit more sense now? Yeah. Okay, so the question we still have to answer is what's the function for the potential field? Well, there are many different ones. You're going to study two of them. And you'll see this is easy, easier than it looks. The first one is the conic potential. So you're assigning the robot a point Q that has coordinates x and y. So this is all possible positions of the robot in the two-dimensional space. And the goal is, again, at a point q, g. We are going to assume that the um, potential is directly proportional to the distance between the robot and the goal. So to calculate the distance between them, we have equation 5 there. That is simply the Euclidean distance between the two points, right? q minus q, g. And that's the norm of the resulting vector. So that's the Euclidean distance between the two points. Basically, the distance between these two guys here, we're going to call that D. Make sense? And now, based on that, we're going to define the conic potential or the potential of any point in that two-dimensional two -dimensional space as the Euclidean distance times a constant. We're going to call that constant uh, what's that? Zeta. This should be positive, not negative. Zeta. So that's just a scaling factor that we can tune that will give us a, a better control over the magnitude of the forces applied to the robot. What is the force? Well, the force is the, the negative of the gradient, so the, neg the gradient of this function. So we have a two-dimensional case. So you now have to take the partial derivative of the potential with respect to x and y, which is over here, and then gives us now a vector of forces. And those forces are now scattered all over the workspace. 
And depending on where we are, the forces will point towards the goal. Are there any questions here before we move on? Yeah? Zeta is up to you to choose. Zeta is a positive scalar, and they will just scale the forces up or down. No, so it's just increasing the magnitude of the force. All right, stretching the, the size of those arrows that we saw before. All right, let's calculate the gradient then. Well, the first one, uh, we have to take the partial derivative of the function we defined um, for the function we defined for the, the gradient, which is simply c, uh, zeta times the distance, and you're going to take the partial derivative with respect to y. So what is the partial derivative with respect to y? Well, we move the square root to the front, minus 1, yeah, times the partial derivative with respect to y of what is inside the square root. So far, so good? So the first portion here remains the same, and now the partial derivative of that with respect to x is simply the partial derivative of the first term here, which is 2 times that, times the derivative of x, which is, with respect to x, is 1. And the second term, the partial derivative is 0. And so this comes to that. And now we can rearrange this now, because let's move the Square, the neg this uh, negative 1 over half here back to the square root and now to the bottom. We have 1 half. This actually actually cancels here. And we have zeta times square root of x, x minus xg squared plus y minus yg squared. And on top, we are left with x minus xg. which is the same as zeta x minus xg divided by d, uh, isn't it? Which is the Euclidean distance between the two points. Yeah? Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, this is another type, but this should all be positive because this is the... Um, this is still the... No, okay, yeah, let's let's make it negative so it's the force, directly the force. Now the force is the is the is the negative derivative of that. Right. So what you have is x minus xg divided by the, the Euclidean distance between the two points. So now we are saying with this that a, the, the, the force we're going to apply in the x direction to the robotic manipulator is the distance or uh, x the, the distance in coordinates between the x coordinates divided by the Euclidean distance between the robot and its destination times a scaling factor. We can repeat the process and do the same now for the partial derivative with respect to y. It's the same structure, and the result is exactly the same, but the top is different. is y minus yg divided by the Euclidean distance between the points. Does that make sense? y minus yg hmm? what's g g is the uh, yg is the y coordinate of the goal from here qg has coordinates xg yg the robot has coordinates x and y No, min minus yg. Hmm? Minus zeta times uh, minus zeta times x minus yg divided by the Euclidean distance between them. Right. So now we have the forces in x and y that are dependent on the location of the robot in the workspace. Right. How do we create the actual force? Oh, the actual force in this case is just the gradient because you already added the negative sign up there, right? Or it could come here if you remove the negative sign from up there. 
And you see that it's now a vector that has x and y components. The denominator here is a scalar. As the Euclidean distance, this is a scalar. The top here is the difference in x position. The top here is the different difference in y position. So I could instead write this in vector form as Q minus capital Q minus QG divided by the Euclidean distance. That's the same equation. All right, but now we go from 2 just to 1 because remember that a Q and QG are two-dimensional vectors. Okay. So there's a problem with this, is that the force is undetermined at Q equals to QG. Why is that? Zero. Because the top is 0, and what's the denominator? When Q equals to QG, what's D? What's the Euclidean distance between them? Zero. Also 0. Right? So the magnitude of the force is zeta whenever Q is different than QG and is undetermined when Q is equal to QG. Well, how do I know that the norm is, is um, the, the magnitude of the force is zeta? Well, because I, I'm here subtracting two vectors and dividing that by their Euclidean distance. So that's the unit vector between them, isn't it? Right, so the magnitude of whatever is in, in red is always 1. Uh, well, well, the magnitude of Q minus QG is D, isn't it? Is D. So you have D over D is always 1. So that, the magnitude here is always 1, is always 1 for all values of Q. So what is left is zeta. So that's why we added this in the beginning. Because otherwise, our force would always be 1, the magnitude of force. Now we can control the magnitude of the force by controlling the value of zeta. Let's do an example here, see if this makes, makes more sense. We have the goal is at 1, 1, and you have the robot in any positions here, but I chose two of them. So let's take the first one there. What's the coordinate of the first position? This is 5, 4, and the coordinate of this one is 4, 1, and the coordinate of the goal is 1, 1. So what is the force? Let's start with this one. What's the force here? The force is the negative of zeta times Q minus QG divided by D of Q. D of Q is the Euclidean distance between the two points. We are using 0 0.5 for zeta. What is Q minus QG? What's the, the value of the vector? When you do Q minus QG, we are making the subtraction of individual components in the vector. So we have 5 minus 4 is 1. And we have 4 minus 1, which is 3. Sorry, uh, I, I, I messed something up here. Let me do this in more details. We have 5 and 4 minus 1, 1. And in the denominator, we have the Euclidean distance. The Euclidean distance is the square root of 5 minus 1 is squared plus 4 minus 1 squared. Does that equation make sense? So what's the top there? The top is is 4 and 3, and the denominator is 5. All right, 16 plus 9 is 5. So here we have a vector 
in x we have negative 4 over 5 times 0 0.5. And in y we have th negative 3 over 5. What's the magnitude of that vector? So it's a vector with two components, 4 over 5 and 3 over 5. So what's the magnitude of this vector? So this is squared plus that squared. One. Square root is 1. one. Right, so the magnitude of the vector is 1. So it, we have indeed the unit force vector. But you're multiplying this by 0 0.5. All right. So what does that actually give us? Let's do the multiplication here is negative 0 0.4 and z negative 0 0.3. All right, that's the result, the final result there. So what does this mean? It means that at this point, starting here, the force vector will have coordinates negative 0 0.4 and negative 0 0.3. So in x, it goes negative 0 0.4, and in y, it goes negative 0 0.3. So it's going to be a force vector like this that will be pointing, if you do it, scale it properly, it will be pointing towards QG. What's the force for this one? Yeah. Because what we have on that side there, we have Q minus QG divided by D. And D is the magnitude of Q minus QG. All right, so if I take the magnitude of the top, then this whole thing goes to 1. Does that make sense? So what's the magnitude if we are here, then? In which way would the force point? Let's do that one. What's the difference? Well, now we have F equals to negative zeta times... 4, 1, minus 1, 1, divided by the Euclidean distance between them. What's the Euclidean distance between these two? Is the square root of 4 minus 1 squared plus 0. All right, so we have negative zeta times 3, 0, divided by 3. Again, a unit force vector. So what's the coordinates of that vector? Well, the coordinate is negative 3 zeta and 0. So it has a component of a negative 3 zeta in x and 0 in y. So we can, if we start here, we are pointing towards the goal like that. And we can now scale the magnitude of that arrow by changing uh, zeta. Sorry, that's not 3. is actually 3 divided by 3 is 1. All right, so that's 1 times zeta. All right, it's 3 divided by 3 from, from here. It's 1 times zeta. Now right, you can now scale the magnitude of the force with um, by changing zeta. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay, so here is a MATLAB implementation for that. So something, are you, are you guys familiar with mesh grid? Sort of? So what I'm doing here in lines 5 and 6 is to create two vectors, one for x, one for y. They go from negative 1 to 1 in intervals of 0 0.125. When I do this mesh grid, I'm basically creating a mesh of points with these two vectors. So one vector has starts at negative 1, goes to 1, and it has small intervals like this. Right? So the other vector goes from negative 1 
and all the way to plus 1 for y. That's how that the two vectors we define. And you do mesh grid, we combine this, all these points, and so on. So we create points all over the intersection of these axes. Does that make sense? So now you have a two-dimensional grid with squares like this. Right? And each of the edges here is a possible combination of these two vectors. So you have now the workspace as a grid of discrete points. Yeah? OK. Now I'm defining a random goal here that I put randomly at this point. And now I can calculate the potential by simply applying the uh, formula we, we defined for the potential as the Euclidean distance between every point in this grid and the goal, the distance in y and x and y. Right? So this is done in, in one go because I'm now considering the distance of all points to 1. So now we create the potential is u, and the gradient is simply, uh, sorry, the force is the negative gradient of u, or the gradient of a negative u, that's the same. So now f and y has, uh, here I have the coordinates of the point, uh, of the forces at every point. So here I'm plotting. So this quiver will point, will plot the arrows if you want to use it later, and then just plotting the, um, the point as well. So this here is the result. So I have two points. You see the potential on top. And then on the bottom here, for this goal and for that goal, you see that the potential changes. And then we see the arrows pointing all towards the goal. So what's, what it takes from is notice that the magnitude doesn't change. And the magnitude of all the, the forces anywhere in the workspace is always the same. And they all point towards the goal. So what, how we use this in practice? Well, in practice, this becomes something like a lookup table. We have a black box here, but it has this potential field of forces. What do we provide to this? What well, we provide the position of the robot, Q, X, and Y. Then you see where the robot is based on that. Say the robot is here. That means, say, I don't know, say this point. What's the output? The output is the force vector with forces Fx and Fy that are to be applied to the robot to move it towards the goal. And if you wanted the force vector to vary, get stronger and you went away from the goal, uh -huh. they would have to be applied to the robot. If you want the forces to be proportional to the distance, then we use a, would use a quadratic potential, which is this one. Before we go into the quadratic potential, is this one clear? Yeah? Towards the goal, yeah. So that's, that, so that's one of the advantages, but also one of the limitations. It doesn't matter how far you are from the goal, the force moving you towards the goal is the same, which may not be desirable. If you're too far from the goal, you probably want more force. Another issue with this is that when you are at the goal, the force is undefined. So we have a mathematical indetermination there. To fix those, um, both of these, you're going to use the quadratic potential. So the quadratic potential, what's the difference? You see that instead of the Euclidean distance, we got rid of the square root. Uh, this is the same idea, but we are getting rid of the, the square root. That's the only difference. But this will simplify the problem a lot, because when you take now the partial derivative of 11 for the gradient with respect to x and y, the result is here. It's a lot easier, uh, using the same principle we did before. So we see that we have the same. We are multiplying that by, um, by zeta. And you multiply it by one half just to get rid of the um, two in front when you take the partial derivative. When you take the partial derivative, two comes to the front. So we added that one half there just to make things look pretty, but it's completely arbitrary. So the result is now a vector of forces 
that it will depend on the distance on x and y. Now you see that the farther you are on x from the goal, the greater the force. Same goes for y. When you took the gradient, we split this into two. So this is the force in x. This is the force in y. But if you want to combine them into a single vector, we can simply use qg minus q because qg has the um, it has both. Right? It has uh, x and y. I noticed that also I flipped everything and then got rid of the negative sign. Okay. So the magnitude of the force depends on the distance to qg. That's uh, we can do the same uh, same one here. Well, let's look at let's take the, the bottom one there. What would be the force for the bottom one? The force would simply be the scaling factor times q. G minus Q. So the force is scaling factor times 1, 1 minus 4, uh, what's that? 4, 1, which is negative 3, 0 times zeta. Now let's place this point over here. If you place that point over there, what changes? Instead of 4, 1, we would have something like, let's say, 6, 1. So the force would be zeta times 1, 1 minus, say, 6, 1, if this is 6. And it would be negative 5, 0. Also now you can see that the farther you go from the goal, the greater the force moving you towards the goal. So this you can look like this you can think about this as like a, a virtual spring connecting both ends. The farther you are, the greater the force moving you towards that. What is the force at the goal? Zero. Uh, so that's the advantage of this one. At the goal, the force is zero. Here is the MATLAB code for that one. Same as before, but you notice here that there's no square root. I just stop over there. Everything else is exactly the same. And here is the, here is the result. So now I added another layer here. You notice that in the first one, I only had the force vector. Now I added another uh, the color contour here, and the color shows the magnitude of the force, the size of the arrow. Now, so low. Blue means low force, yellow means high force. And you can also see that the size of the arrows is decreasing as we approach the goal. Right. For the same two points. Right. So the farther you are, the greater the force. And we can see that from these two plots. Now, there is, this could also be a problem. Because let's say you are too far from a goal. And if you're too far from a goal, the force will be potentially too large, which could be... Um, a potential hazard if you apply that force directly to the robot. Right? So we have two ways. The first one has a constant force, which would solve this problem, but has an indetermination in the center, in the goal, because the force is zero. This one has now a force that increases with respect to a distance, but you don't want that force to be too large when you are too far from the goal. What's the solution? We, put we can put more goals. Yeah, but that, that's a different, uh, would be a different application. Why don't we combine them? Combine the two potentials. We can have this one when you are near the goal. So as you approach the goal, you, the force decreases and you reach zero. And when you are far from the goal, we can define a threshold beyond which we switch from this potential back to the other one. Now the force becomes constant. And that threshold we can define. Right, so we can do a uh, hybrid version of these two. So here's the difference between them. We can clearly see how the forces are decreasing. So this is the conic, and that's the quadratic 
potentially you can see the, the difference between them, right? So what you can do to fix this problem is to use a potential with a hybrid definition. So you're going to use both. They use the conic field when the robot is far from the goal. Why? Because then the forces are constant. So all in this light blue here, the forces are constant, conic potential. Past the threshold, the quadratic potential is used. So the forces now decrease and will reach a zero when you reach the goal. We are going to define this boundary arbitrarily as a circle around the goal having a distance dg. So if the, if the distance between q and qg is greater than dg, what do we use? The conic. If the distance between q and qg is smaller than dg, dg, then you use the quadratic potential. Right? And this dg is up to us to choose to define that arbitrarily. Yeah. So we are defining two different fields. And let's assume that the robot is around here. We are putting a boundary in the quadratic potential. We are saying that if that distance is greater than dg, we're going to use the conic potential because you're outside the bound. So the force here will be constant. So if you keep it get farther and farther away, the force will never increase. And you're saying that inside the circle, so if, to be inside the circle, the distance between Q and QG is, is smaller than DG, then you use the quadratic potential and then the force will linearly decrease as we approach the goal. Okay, and DG is a threshold where you switch from one to the other. Okay, so now our potential is redefined. The, f the first line there is exactly the same and is only valid, that's the conic potential, is only valid if the distance is greater. Um, hold on. I think these are flipped. All right. The distance, dg is great. No, that's right. The distance is, no, that's flipped. All right. The distance must be greater than dg. Yeah? Yeah? So if the distance is greater than dg, we want to use the quadratic potential. Hold on. This is the conic potential. That's the quadratic. All right, so this is right. If the distance is, is smaller than dg, we want the quadratic. If the distance is greater, we use the conic potential. Now you notice the addition of some new terms here. Right, this term over there and this term over here, they are added to ensure continuity at the boundary. They were not there before when we defined the conic potential. Right? We're just putting them here. So when you take the gradient, we have a continuous uh, zone around dg. We are not, we are not, not going to have a sudden drop of forces around dg. So somebody figured it out for us that those are the terms we have to add there to ensure that around dg we have a continuous force transition. When you take the derivative, we go back to what we had before. Uh, we have now the two um, forces, one using the quadratic and one using the gradient, the, the, uh, the conic potential, just switching between them. So here is the implementation. I'm basically calculating the conic potential, then the quadratic potential, and just making a if here. If the distance is greater than or than dg, I go with one. If not, I use the other one. All right, and create one potential u after that, and then take the gradient of that one. Here's the result. In, you can see that we started this one here. Inside the circle, we see the force decreasing towards zero. Outside of the circle, the force is constant. Uh, so that works. The other one there is the same, but now the circle is smaller. DG is smaller. So everything outside of that circle is the same force. And then everything inside the circle is standing um, towards um, a different value. Right? And then the, here is the same, like a big one and a smaller uh, zone over there. Um, 
and I believe that these should be flipped right? because the force is decreasing right? so the force is decreasing towards zero there right so this should be the the uh, the bounds there just should be should be flipped okay so what's the advantage here is that if you're now too far from the goal it doesn't matter you still get um, a constant force and once you enter that a circle that we predefined then uh, the robot goes uh, the, the force applied to the robot decreases now let's look at a repulsive potential so we now we have a attractive potential the robot has been attracted to a certain point now let's do a repulsive potential instead so the idea is that the magnitude of the repulsive force should increase as you approach an obstacle as approach a wall you want the force to linearly increase so we have to define a few things here the first one is the position of the robot the second one is the position QO that is now the position of the obstacle if the obstacle has more than one point is like a line we would consider the closest distance between the two which is here this capital D so this is the distance between them Another parameter of interest is that a circle that has a radius of d o. We are saying that in, outside of that circle, we don't want the robot to see the obstacle. If you are too far from the obstacle, we want to ignore it. So we are saying that we only take, uh, start applying forces, repulsive forces to the robot once it is inside of that circle of radius d g. Make sense? outside of it we don't want the robot to feel that obstacle otherwise that obstacle would affect the forces in the entire workspace right rather than just uh, around around it so here is the definition of the repulsive potential we don't need to go over how this was done but you see something interesting is now inversely proportional to the distance Right? We, now the potential is increasing based on the distance. That makes sense. It goes well with the definition we had before. If we are close to a goal, we want the potential to be zero because that's where we want the robot to be. If we are far from the potential, the, the, the goal, we want the potential to be high because we want to stay away from that and move towards the low potential. Here is the same, but now the potential reversed because that's a repulsive field. We don't want to be near the point, so we de de define now the potential in the other way. The closer we are to the obstacle, the greater the potential. Right? And we added here a, this, uh, this term here is just to ensure again, continuity in the force field. Right? So the potential is that if we are inside the circle and the zero if we are outside of that circle. So outside of the circle, the robot would not feel the presence of that obstacle in it. we we'll have to go in the opposite way yeah so the force we calculate in the same way we take the negative gradient of that right? so the gradient for this one is a bit more complicated we're taking the gradient of the top there here is the result uh, this is constant this is a vector this is constant that's a vector um, yeah so sorry no th all, all this is constant are constants so just a magnitude and that's a vector that's the gradient of the q that we calculated before now we know how to calculate that but always multiply by this constant this is easy to 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 implement let's see what the result of all this is i put a obstacle in the center there and defined randomly a circle around it so you can see here the potential potential is zero everywhere except near the obstacle where the potential now goes to a certain value when you take the gradient of this that is the result look at the forces how they work the forces are increasing as you approach the goal and the direction of the forces are now flipped their point against it so if you move the robot or the haptic device towards the goal you feel a repulsive force moving you away from it. 
it's just one. It's just um, the resolution in, in MATLAB. This is just one peak. It depends on how we define it, yeah, yeah. But ideally, that's what would happen because it shouldn't reach that point, right? So let's see what, uh, what we get over here. It should indeed because these two terms would be divided by zero. And then this would tend to zero. So as we have the same problem as before. When you reach the, the, the goal or the obstacle, the force is undefined. Here is another one, just moving uh, moving the point around. We see now the magnitude, well, it's the same one, but now with the magnitude of the force, you see that the magnitude is zero outside of the circle that I randomly defined there. And as you approach the goal, now the force is um, increasing in magnitude and the points away from the obstacle. Yeah, here is another one. Pretty neat. What do you do if you have more than one obstacle? More than one point? Combine them how? How do you combine more than one obstacle? What should we add? Should we add the forces? Should we add the potentials? What do we do? We add all the potentials, exactly. We add the potential of individual obstacles or goals all together, and then we take the gradient of the resulting potential. All right, so in this case here, if you have now two points, two obstacles, we can simply add the gradient, the, the, excuse me, the potential of any obstacles we have, and once that is done, then we take the gradient of them. Okay, so we calculate, the nice thing is that the code we just used will be fine here because they're calculating individual potentials. We simply add them up and then we take the gradient to calculate the, the forces. So when you look at this, you may think, oh, this is overly complicated because I didn't need all this to come up with a force field that are points away from a point. So that's fair. But what happens if you have more than one point? Right? The, the, the question is not that simple. So here is the same with two points. So now we have two peaks. We have the same definition of the two circles. Uh, if you are away from the obstacle, force is zero. And as, as we move towards them, then you have a repulsive force moving you away from it. And this was calculated by simply adding the potential of the two and then uh, taking the derivative of them. No, there's absolutely no relation. This is just, it's not a transfer function. This is just uh, the magnitude of a scalar in a pl plotted in a, on a 2D plane. Any questions here? No? What happens if you have an obstacle and a goal? What do we do? Same thing, just add them in the same and then take the derivative. So here we have the goal, the attractive potential, the repulsive potential. We calculate them individually. We add them up and then we take the gradient. So look what uh, happened there. Look at uh, the gradient first. With the gradient, we see that this concave surface that attends to the goal. The goal is right here. But you see also the appearance of this big spike here around an obstacle. So if you were to go around the obstacle here, it would feel a force preventing you from moving there. All right, so this, for those working with haptics and we want to create these, these types of uh, sensations, this is the easiest way to do that. So the, if you let the robot go, it would tend towards the bottom of the potential. And if you move it up, then you encounter more and more resistance. You have to go uphill. And if you hit these uh, 
peak here, then you feel the, the highest force. Now look at the force, what happens? Look how the obstacle now is uh, shaping the forces around it. So this is, what, what potential is, is it the conic or the quadratic? This is a conic because the force is constant, and this one uses its own definition. So the forces all point towards that, except around the obstacle, where the forces just keep you away from the obstacle, and then you go over there. All right, so if the robot was around here, it would likely be pushed down and then eventually to the goal, like that, along the path of minimum energy. Make sense? I think the utility of this is very clear uh, for robot control because you could just let the robot arm go and it would go where you want, but also in the context of haptics where you're now moving a haptic device and if you are away, it can pull you towards a goal or can repel you from an obstacle as you move it. <clears throat> Any questions? So how would you go about implementing this? All you have really to, calc to determine is this force field as a lookup table. Uh, you see where you are in the workspace, you look at the, the forces and you apply that to the robot or to the haptic device. Everything we studied here is a two-dimensional because that's easier to show, but in the, in the labs you would use at least a three-dimensional force field. Right? So we would add the Z direction to it. And then these forces become three-dimensional vectors. Okay? Now let's do a little complication here because this is too easy and then we get bored. So um, let's assume that we have now a trajectory of points. So I want to go to, the robot wants to go to the goal, but I want to go to the goal following a specific trajectory. So if I let the robot go from where it is, the idea is that it will first be attracted to the trajectory and then moves towards the goal from that, along that trajectory. So what I'm going to define here is a new potential. We're going to call this a quadratic potential. It's simply the, um, the distance in y and x times the distance in y and x. So basically, this is the vector uh, matrix representation of the Euclidean distance because we are simply multiplying this with the transposed of itself. Right? It's just taking the square of x square of y. Multiplying that by a matrix S is a unit matrix that are now, instead of zeta, we have a unit matrix. So you can control the weights that we apply in X and Y directly. Does that make sense? Right, because we have, let's say, X and Y. We are multiplying this by another vector, X and Y. So these are the differences in X. These are the differences in Y. So basically just squaring that. Right, and then representing in a matrix format. But I'm also adding here this U0i, which is a offset that we can define. We'll see what that does later. It's simply an offset that we can define as being, for example, how far you are from the goal along the path or something like that. Now, the problem when you have multiple points, especially when you deal with potentials, is that, as you could see, the uh, A point will affect the potential everywhere in the workspace. If you have a, a multitude of points, you probably don't want that to happen because the, you, only have, you only want close points to have an effect on where the robot is, not far away points. Right? So what we're going to do to prevent that is to give a weight to each point depending how far th those points are from the robot. And to do that, we're going to use a Gaussian kernel. Does that ring a bell, Gaussian kernel? Yeah? And we'll define it like that. The exponential of 1 minus sigma squared times the Euclidean distance between the point and the robot. Sigma is a, a parameter that we can choose, we can tune. And the result is this. If this is point QI, 
this is the magnitude of the Gaussian kernel for every other point on this two-dimensional plane. So I'm saying that a point close to QI, if I take this point here, will have a high weight, whereas the point that is up here will have a low weight. So this is now telling us that a point, if I use this weight, multiply, for example, the force by this weight, I'm, I'm telling, um, I'm, I'm saying that I want points that are close to QI to have a greater, uh, close to the robot to have a greater influence on the force it will experience. How far do I want points to affect the robot? Well, that's the, the, the job of sigma. The greater sigma, the greater the influence of a given point on the robot's trajectory throughout its workspace. The smaller sigma, the smaller the influence of that point on the robot's trajectory, on the robot's force, excuse me. Okay, so now every point in this workspace is affected by QI following the weights that we assign through this kernel. If you have 100 points, QI, then you have 100 kernels. Each of them is specifying the, the, the weight of every, um, the infl uh, how that point influences the robot when the robot is in any of these positions. Make sense? Yeah? So if you have uh, several points QI, several points that will affect the, um, the robot's force, we'll have, if you have 20 of those points, I have 20 of these. Each one of these is telling me that if the robot is here, the influence of this point is proportional to the magnitude of that function. So if I'm far here, this point doesn't influence my potential because I'm too far from it. But as soon as I get closer, then this point has more influence. Right? But remember that we have multiple points in the workspace. We are now defining the zone of action of each point in the trajectory, in the force specified by the robot. So how do we do that? Well, we can combine these two functions now, and that's where it gets a bit complicated. The first function is nothing other than the potential we saw before expressed in matrix form. The second is the Gaussian kernel that de defines the influence of a point in space. To calculate now the new potential, we are going to do a weighted average of them. We are multiplying the potential for a given point with its weight, and then you divide it by the sum of all weights. We multiply the potential of a point Q uh, by the weight of if individual point that is attracting that, and then you divide that by the sum of all weights. Now if I had, let's say, two points, I would calculate potential for point one, multiply now on the, this two-dimensional graph each point with the weight, and do the same for the next one, and then add everything up, divide by the sum of all weights. The result of that is something like this. These are all the points that I want to go along on X and Y. So it's a trajectory like that. Look at the potential. The potential looks like a valley that is around that trajectory. So if I let the robot go from any point here or there, it will tend down to the center of the valley. And look at the force field. The force field is f moving you towards that valley and is low potential around the trajectory. How do we uh, um, um, control the magnitude of that force? Well, that's through the stiffness matrix S, think, uh, which is doing the job of zeta for us. Okay, so here's the MATLAB implementation. We have the workspace with all point Qs, Q1, 2, and 3. So you have to calculate the influence of point, uh, excuse me, the potential of point Q1 with respect to all points in the workspace. 
right? We did that as just basically having one point, we calculate the potential for all points in the workspace. That makes sense? Yeah, that's exactly how we started. And then we do the same for all other points. Point two has its own potential. Point three has its own potential. But these are the unweighted potentials. Those are the potentials that um, uh, don't, don't, don't have the Gaussian kernel. We could do the same with the Gaussian kernel now. We take, for this point, we see how this point will influence the, uh, have uh, the weight of this point when the robot is here, which is probably very high, the weight of this point when the robot is far away from it, which is very low, and so on. And we do that for all points again. So each point has a Gaussian kernel. Then we multiply them. That's what this line is doing. We multiply the potential with the weight. Once everything is multiplied, then we add everything up to create one potential. That's the sum of all potentials here. All right. But we, we now have to deal with the fact that we multiplied everything by omega, by the, the weight. So that's why we also sum all the weights. And then we divide this by the weight to normalize it. And then the result is the weighted potential field. So here is the code for that. that uh, this can be very useful. We met, we, there's something missing here in my explanation was this potential uh, offset. There's something that it doesn't quite work here because what happens once the robot reaches the trajectory? What's the force? Is zero. Once the robot gets to the trajectory, it is zero. But what if we want the robot to go over there? The potential by itself can do it because so long as the robot, as soon as the robot reaches the bottom of the valley here, nothing will push it towards the goal. How do I fix that? I somehow create, uh, I shift the valley up, I incline the valley so that the robot can now go down. Now how do I do that? Well, by simply use, making use of this offset over here. The, the weight with the end goal would, could, would be probably more. More, yeah. Yeah, we could do it that way, yeah. But we could also include an offset here that, let's say, this value decreases as you approach the target. When you take the derivative of that, that is clearly a force pointing towards it. Here is one, one idea. I want the robot to go to that goal. These are all points in the trajectory. And um, I'm going to, so if I plot here yx, this is the weight I'm going to assign to that u value. As it goes along the trajectory, it decreases. The way I'm doing this is simply by saying that it's a distance to the goal. u0i is the distance from each of these points of the trajectory to the goal is squared. So what happens there? Well, look at the potential, how it changes. This is the one without I0, uh, excuse me, without U I0, without offset. You see that the force is simply pointed to the trajectory. Once it gets to the trajectory, the robot stops. This one has that um, value of K here a bit high, uh, that is non-zero. So now you see that uh, this is kind of shaping all the forces. They are kind of moving towards the final point. They are still bringing you to the trajectory, but then towards the final goal. And that one has an even via, uh, higher value than this. And you can see that the forces are even more pointing towards the final goal. All right, so K here varies from zero, so there's nothing. No offset to 0 0.25 in the last one is increasing that way. 
Right? So the higher k, the higher the distortion towards the goal. This is a random way that I found to assign this offset, but you can come up with something better um, easily. Okay? So how do we actually use all this? Two ways. If you want to use the robot only, then we can simply have a potential field that will control the robot. This is actually used in the industry. The advantage of this approach is that is, there's no time in the equations. It's simply um, position-based. Right, so if it was time-dependent, for example, the longer the robot is, think about a PID controller, the longer the robot stays away from a trajectory, the higher the integrator part of the controller builds up, and the more energy it will take once the robot is released. Here, it doesn't matter because it's not time-dependent. If you hold it away from a position, all we count is the distance to that position, right? So the force does increase with time. So all we need to do is create a potential field based on the obstacles or um, goals that we have, or trajectories, create a force. Force is applied to the robot. We get a robot position that is input back in here to see where it is, to see what force comes out, and the process continues, right? If you want to use haptic feedback, to control the robot, that is perfectly, perfectly fine. The only difference is that we use now the haptic device in the center here, and the forces that uh, are coming from the potential field are being applied to the haptic device, by the haptic device to the user. You see the difference is that now motion is from the robot comes from the haptic device. I move the haptic device, the robot mimics my motion. And the forces are no longer being applied to the robot, the forces are being applied to the operator hand through the haptic device. So that means that uh, there, was a, there was a project with, um, uh, who, who was working on it? They want to have a, a orthopedic, simulate orthopedic surgery, was that you? No. You had like a square, you want to up to drill inside that square and not deviate from it. Who was it? No, it's not folks are not here? Yeah. Right. So you have like a square and you want to operate inside of it, and if you deviate from that, you want to feel a force. How could you use this in that context? Well, we can define a square where there are no obstacles, and everything outside of that square has obstacles. Your, your, your haptic device controls the robot, so if you move the haptic device, the robot mimics it. Right? But now you know that if the robot gets outside of that square, there is going to be a force, and that force is being applied to your hand. So we'll feel the forces when the robot gets out of that. 